Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very delighted to welcome you to today's symposium, Adrian Piper, The Long View. Today's symposium is in conjunction with the exhibition, Adrian Piper, A Synthesis of Intuitions, 1965 to 2016, which just opened here at the Hammer last night. The exhibition is the result of a four-year collaboration between the artist, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Hammer Museum, and it's the most comprehensive retrospective of Piper's work to date. The exhibition was organized by Christophe Cherie, Chief Curator of Drawings and Prints at MoMA, Connie Butler, Chief Curator at the Hammer Museum, David Platzker, former Curator of Drawings and Prints at MoMA, with MoMA Curatorial Assistant Tessa Ferreos. Today's symposium is presented with support of the Museum of Modern Art, and we want to express our thanks to visionary women for their support of today's symposium as well. As you can all see in the printed programs you received, um, we'll first have a panel, and that'll be followed by an hour and a half lunch break, and then we'll have a panel from 2.15 to 3.45, followed by a coffee break, and then the final two panels from 4 to 6.30. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hammer Chief Curator Connie Butler. Good morning. I want to add my welcome to Claudia's and also just to thank her entire team in public programs for so beautifully executing this day for us. <clears throat> I just heard on the radio, actually on the way here, uh, a quote from Toni Morrison who said, if the books you want to read don't exist, you have to write them. I've always felt this way about making exhibitions and in particular making exhibitions of bodies of work that deserve greater public attention and renown with the broader public. Adrian Piper's exhibition has been this kind of project. It has been my great honor to celebrate, uh, sorry, collaborate, <laughs> and also celebrate, uh, with my colleagues from MoMA on this uh, monumental exhibition, Adrian Piper, Concepts and Intuitions, 1965 to 2016, which represents 50 years of astounding art production and a body of work that has had an enormous influence on now three generations of artists. It's our hope that this exhibition and today's discussion will allow us to begin to understand not only her work, but what I'm going to call the Piper Effect, this idea of enormous uh, influence. I'm not going to speak specifically about Adrienne's work. I'm going to leave that to the experts here today, and we have an, a good long day. Um, <clears throat> but I want to acknowledge Christophe Cherix, Chief Curator of Drawings and Prints at MoMA, with whom I curated the exhibition, who I think is here today. Uh, as well as Tessa, Tessa Ferreros, um, and uh, just acknowledge them as great partners um, also in today's event. We couldn't have organized this without MoMA's critical support. And I also want to thank Glenn Lowry, MoMA's director, as well as Ann Philbin, our great director here at The Hammer, who has supported this project, today's event, and everything attached to the exhibition from the very beginning. As well, Erin Christavale, uh, assistant curator here at The Hammer, and Vanessa Arzmendi, curatorial assistant, work closely with me on the exhibition. And you'll meet Erin uh, later on today as she's going to do some of the introducing of panels. This exhibition has truly touched every department in the museum and at MoMA. And I'm grateful to all of my colleagues for supporting our show in myriad ways. I also just want to call your attention to an important piece of the exhibition, which actually is at ICA LA and opens to the public today, and that's um, the installation What It's Like, What It Is from 1993, which was part of MoMA's, it was actually commissioned for MoMA's dislocations exhibition at that time. Uh, it's a monumental work, fantastic uh, and important work of Adrian's, and something that we couldn't execute here because of its size. It was at the atrium at MoMA, in MoMA's atrium. Um, and so ICA came on as a partner, and so that's, uh, I urge you to see that um, when you can. And we're really grateful that they were able to partner with us on that. So a couple of words about today's structure. We have um, panels followed by a keynote at 4 o'clock. Um, but I also just wanted to highlight that there will be another uh, event on November 3rd, another and final panel titled Deconstructing the Truism of Race as a Social, Co Social Construct. And that panel will uh, include philosophers Naomi Zak of the University of Oregon, Rebecca Tuval of Rhodes College, and Diarmuid Costello of the University of Warwick. And they'll discuss the way in which Piper's art interrogates racial identity, focusing on specific works, as well as Piper's own writings about race. And those writings include 
Passing for White, Passing for Black, and Escape to Berlin, a travel memoir, which I should add we have um, on sale in the museum store, it just recently published by the artist. And that's on Saturday, November 3rd at 2. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panel this morning, which is titled Voices in Dialogue, Fellow Travelers. In this panel, <clears throat> Adrian, Pi Adrian Piper's colleagues in art and philosophy compare notes on their experiences of the events of the 1960s and 70s and their perspectives on Piper's work. So the uh, guests who will join me up here on stage are first Donna Dennis, an artist and friend from the early 1970s who's um, traveled here from New York. Bruce Altschuler, professor of museum studies at NYU, Harvard philosopher, uh, philosophy classmate and friend of the artists from the mid-1970s. <clears throat> and Jeffrey Deitch, gallerist and colleague from the early 1970s in New York City as well, and classmate at Harvard in the mid-1970s. Um, we're very happy to have you all here. There are more extended bios available in your program, so I won't take up further time with that right now, but I would just welcome the panelists up on stage. And uh, there you are. And um, let the day begin. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Connie. Um, actually, my name is Bruce Altshuler. I'll be starting, then Donna, then Jeffrey. Let's see if the image appears. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here as one of Adrian's fellow travelers, although my fellow traveling was episodic and took different forms. As you know from the introduction, I was a graduate student with Adrian in the Harvard Philosophy Department during the 1970s. And our friendship developed in environments of discussion in the library and corridors of the philosophy building, in the grad student lounge, and at social gatherings. Adrian came to Harvard in the fall of 1974. And as I, <coughs> excuse me, as I had arrived three years earlier and was done with my courses and working on my dissertation, we never were in a class together. But the, but the intellectual life of the department, at least for graduate students, largely was lived in informal conversation with our peers. So we talked, we came to like one another, and in 1977, we both left Harvard. Adrian on a fellowship um, to study in Germany, and me to academic teaching. About five years later, my career took a turn out of philosophy and into the art and museum world. And in the late 80s, I began working on a book about the history of 20th century exhibitions, the last chapter of which dealt with the show in which Adrian had played a part. At that point, I was fellow traveling with the Adrian Piper of the 1960s, and I would continue to do so in subsequent years while researching other exhibitions of that period. At the beginning of 2016, while teaching a class on museums in Berlin, my fellow traveling returned firmly to the present when Adrian and I were able to spend some time together and she told me about her coming MoMA exhibition. And while the demeanor of her writing can be pointed and fierce, as a, fr as a friend, Adrian has been gracious, affable, and fun. Although we previously had talked on a number of occasions, the first extended conversation I remember our having was in the philosophy building, Emerson Hall, which was located across the street from the Fogg Museum. I regularly would go to the Fogg, although I rarely spoke about art with my fellow students. But when I ran to Adrian that day, I began telling her about what I had just seen. I believe that it was the Fogg's great Van Gogh self-portrait, a work given by the artist to Gauguin, later owned by the important German museum director, Hugo von Schutte, confiscated as degenerate art by the Nazis from the Munich State Museum, and auctioned in 1939 in Switzerland to raise funds for the German war effort. Adrian then said that she was going to tell me something that I must promise not to tell anyone else at Harvard. After promising, she told me that she was a serious artist with an ongoing practice and career, and she gave me a pamphlet that she had written. 
But I'm sure that at that time, I did not appreciate the broadened conception of art that it revealed, and against which I probably was defended by my own quite traditional aesthetic views. There were many important philosophers teaching at Harvard when we were there, including Stanley Cavell, Nelson Goodman, Bob Nozick, and Hilary Putnam. Not surprisingly, all of the senior faculty were men, though. But the two giants were Willard Van Orman Quine and John Rawls, and both were significant for Adrian. Quine, a major philosopher of logic and language, occasioned a highly upsetting moment for he was a distinguished faculty member whom she wrote about at the beginning of her essay, Passing for White, Passing for Black. Walking up to Adrian at the reception for new graduate students, the politically conservative Quine immediately said to her, Miss Piper, you're about as black as I am. John Rawls, on the other hand, was staunchly liberal. In his 1971 book, The Theory of Justice, with, with his deeply argued view of justice as fairness, established him as the most important political philosopher of the last century. Rawls was Adrian's dissertation advisor, and the relationship was a complicated one, as you will understand if you read her recent memoir, Escape to Berlin. But importantly, Rawls' thought was deeply anchored in the work of Immanuel Kant, a central focus of her philosophical concerns in writing. As some, some of you might have noticed, the title of the MoMA exhibition, A Synthesis of Intuitions, and that of the show here at the Hammer, Concepts and Intuitions, refer to central Kantian notions. I also came to Harvard very interested in Kant. And any, uh, anyone who has worked seriously on his complex and profound texts will, I think, find familiar the power of the experience presented in Adrienne's 1971 work, Food for the Spirit, where she documents herself photographically during her initial struggle with Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. When the work was first shown publicly in 1987, these 14 photographs were juxtaposed with pages from Adrienne's annotated copy of the standard English translation of the first critique. Uh, this is my own beat up copy. The book is for me the most amazing work in philosophy, one in which between any two points others open up, sucking the reader into a philosophical structure from which it can be difficult to emerge. I completely understand her experience of reading Kant that summer while doing yoga and fasting, though I never have done any yoga and fast only on Yom Kippur. Her account of feeling that she was losing her mind and her sense of self of certain passages causing her to break out in a cold sweat might sound overwrought, but it would ring true to many who have wrestled significantly with this book, or at least it rings true to me. Now, people often identify analytic philosophy of the kind that char characterized philosophy at Harvard as cold and forbidding. But as Adrian and her work show, analytic philosophical argumentation often is impassioned and is connected with deep feelings. In his introduction to her two volumes of collected writings, Rob Storr spoke of Adrian's delight in clarity. But I tend to think instead, and I'm not being at all negative here, of her mania for clarity, for rational deliberation and wholesale commitment to the results of that reasoning. As a thinker and interlocutor, she is demanding and intense a term that certainly characterizes both her art and her philosophizing. I'm reminded here, of, as some of you might be, who um, saw the recent Getty exhibition on the work of the curator Harold Zeman, that Zeman's primary criterion for value, valuing an artwork was intensity, and his title for his own general project was The Museum of Obsessions. I know about Zeman because my primary area of research for the past 30 years has been the history of exhibitions. And it was this work that brought me back into contact with Adrian, or with the Adrian of the late 60s. I was researching an exhibition generally referred to as the January Show, organized by the conceptual art impresaria Seth Siegelaub in an office rented for the occasion in Midtown Manhattan. 
The artists were Robert Barry, Douglas Hubler, Joseph Kasuth, and Lawrence Wiener. Their publicity portrait here certainly displaying the gendered self-presentation of the time. While each of them installed two works on site, the show actually contained 32 pieces, with every artist listing eight works in the catalog, which was the only place in which the entire exhibition could be found. As Siegelab wrote in the information she developed at the front desk, the exhibition consisted of the ideas communicated in the catalog. The physical presence of the work is supplementary to the catalog. And doing research in Siegelau's archive, I came upon a photo of the person giving out those information sheets, and this was Adrian Piper. For Adrian had been hired as the secretary for the show, answering the phone, providing information, and distributing the catalog. During the opening um, day, she had an additional job, which was to document Doug Hubler's duration piece number six. Huber had placed a rectangle of sawdust at the office entrance, and every half hour, Adrian was to take a Polaroid of the dispersing material, then tape the photograph within an area that Huber had indicated on the wall. And as I continued to work on other exhibitions of the time, Adrian kept appearing, including in Lucy Lepard's so-called numbers exhibitions in Seattle and Vancouver titled for the populations of those cities and largely created from artists' instructions. And there she was in Kinniston McShine's politically framed International Compendium of Conceptualist Art Making at MoMA, Information, where she exhibited a loose-leaf binder of blank pages in which the public was invited to write. Their, contribu their contributions eventually filled seven binders and more than 1,900 pages. In the mid-80s, I found myself becoming more interested in conceptual and performative practices. And my first art publication concerned a show of works from the Silverman Fluxus Collection at the Library of the Museum of Modern Art. And that essay, in part, was prompted by conversations I had had with another former philosophy major, Alan Capro, who was, as a piece of his own, laboring in the back room and doing various errands at the gallery where I worked. It was, it was while working there at Zabriskie Gallery, by the way, that I met your director, Ann Philbin, who was working downstairs at the Borgnick Gallery. During the late 80s and 90s, then, I would come to see Adrian as participating in an artistic enterprise with which I was increasingly concerned intellectually. And in 1997, in order to learn more about her work, I agreed to write a review for the Art Journal of her recently published collected papers. Now I'll conclude with a few words about the relationship between Adrian's philosophical work and her work in art, or rather about Adrian as a philosopher and Adrian as an artist. I say the latter because I am not going to talk about sub substantive arguments or theories, although there's, there's much to say about that. Instead, I speak from a concern about the interests drives, and commitments that motivate her philosophical and artistic projects. For as she said in a 1996 talk on wearing three hats, the hats being those of philosophy, art, and yoga, her varieties of professional activities are all equally essential expressions of oneself. There is a precision of thought, both as frame and guide, a deep commitment to rationality as the ground of conceptual investigation and personal behavior and pursuit. There is the constant awareness of connections among beliefs, attitudes, and actions. And there is the demand for intellectual and personal responsibility and the insistence on interrogating and confronting our claims and behavior. I think in this regard of the probable trust registry, with its challenge to commit to three statements, promises that might seem readily made until you think harder about what such agreement would imply. One of these assertions, I will always mean what I say, brings me back to Harvard. For while thinking about this talk, I was reminded of the title of a book by Stanley Cavell, who recently passed away and who taught there while we were students 
although I have no idea of the degree to which Adrian engaged with his work or with him. Um, this being L.A., I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, his book, Pursuits of Happiness, about Hollywood comedies of the 30s and 40s, which I recommend to all of you. Now, those who knew Stanley Cavell will find this a very strange juxtaposition, for it would be hard to think of someone more different from Adrian in philosophical style and temperament. For while Adrian tackles issues very directly, Stanley would work around and around things, moving through indirection and multiple reference within a unique form of philosophical discussion. Yet the two of them are united by an insistence on taking seriously our everyday speech and actions and the beliefs and personal structures with which they are linked. And they both do so employing modes of high self-reflection. As you look at Adrian's exhibition and think of her as philosopher and artist, feeling the unity of her intellectual and emotional um, concerns, and reading her explanatory accounts of her work, you will see strong expressions of that single self that she mentions. And you will see a powerful coming together of the conceptual analysis of conceptual analysis, moral outrage, and the striving to hold all of us to the beliefs and commitments of an examined life. Thank you. Adrian Piper and I became friends as members of a women's consciousness raising group in New York that met from 1971 to 1973. The first images I will show you were taken on the occasion of a reunion dinner we had at my loft in the early 1980s. In this first photo, you see from left to right, Rosemary Mayer standing, Adrian, Grace Murphy, and Jane Weiss. Here I am cooking and talking. We were having a very good time. We hadn't seen one another in a while. Um, Adrian, Rosemary, and I were all young artists at the, same, at the time. I was born in 1942, Rosemary in 1943, and Adrian in 1948. Grace Murphy was born in 1945, and Jane around then too. Grace and Rosemary met when they were both attending and all-girls high school, St. Saviors in Brooklyn. Grace and Jane met when they were both students at Hunter College in New York around 1964. Jane did graduate work in developmental psychology, and Grace was studying history. Grace went on to a career as a psychotherapist and writer, and Jane a career in advertising. In her teens, Rosemary married Vito Acconci. So this is obviously their wedding portrait. By the time our group came together, Rosemary and Vito had divorced, but were still good friends. I got to know Rosemary through the poet Ted Berrigan. One evening in the late 1960s, Ted took me to meet a couple who were living in a loft just below Cooper Union on the Bowery. As I remember, the loft was dark, narrow, long, and low-ceilinged. The walls were completely lined with books. Although Rosemary and I met that night, it was not until two or three years later we became close friends. I had graduated from Carleton College in Minnesota and gone to Paris for a year to paint. Peter Sheldahl, who was, who was first a poet and now an art critic, had been in my class at Carleton. From 1964 to 65, he was also in Paris, and he and I and his first wife hung out together. When I came back to New York in late 1965, Peter introduced me to the friends he had made around St. Mark's Poetry Project, which is where I met Ted, who took me to Vito and Rosemary's that night. Adrian and Rosemary met as students at the School of Visual Arts. When Rosemary died in 2014, Adrian wrote a tribute to Rosemary that was published in Art Forum. 
It describes an extremely important friendship at a formative time for both of them. So I'm going to read that to you. So this is Adrian. Um, Rosemary was my classmate in Mr. Burgess's drawing course in my second year at the School of Visual Arts in the fall semester of 1967. We met at its first class meeting. I sat down next to her because I noticed that she was reading Goethe's Elective Affinities, 1809, while we were waiting for Mr. Burgers, Baggers to start the class. She was the only student in the class reading a book. As I had just finished it, I asked her whether she was enjoying it. She said she was finding it a bit dry and much preferred The Sorrows of Young Werther, 1774. I hadn't read Werther, but I wrote down the title and later did read it because of her recommendation. I had not yet figured out how to be both an artist and an intellectual. The problem was one of clashing role models. Whereas my artist heroes were the likes of Honoré Daumier, Vincent van Gogh, and Auguste Rodin, my intellectual heroes included figures like Albert Camus, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and Ralph Ellison. Actually, all of them have a lot more in common than I realized at the time. In those days, I could not find a way to be all of them. I learned how to do that from Rosemary. She had first arrived at SVA, where she was immediately promoted to the second year on the strength of her artwork. Shortly before, she had refused Harvard University's offer of, graduate, of a graduate fellowship to do a doctorate in the classics department. She had been the first woman student, or one of the first, to be so honored. But at that time, she was married to a poet who, she said, had prevailed upon her to become an artist instead. Once I met her husband, Vito Acanci, I could imagine that dialogue and the intensity with which it must have been conducted. The result was a body of work that was in love with the physical properties of materials, textures, cloths, and their exploration, but that easily cohabited with a serious and highly developed intellectual life. She was a voracious reader of literature, criticism, and the classics, and fluent in Greek and Latin. It never would have occurred to her to not read Goethe in a drawing class. Nor did she feel even the slightest pressure to, to show off her figurative draftsmanship in a painting class. Instead, she submitted for presentation and discussion two large companion hard edge minimalist color field paintings. That's, that's what you see on the screen. Um, based on a combinatorial system she had devised. For the first, she divided the surface of the canvas into a grid, bisecting each square cell diagonally into two triangles. She determined the color of each triangle by combining the colors in couplets, mixing them, and recursively applying the same combinatorial formula to each resulting color for each successive cell. For the second, she repeated the operation, except she began with a different combination of primary colors in the first cell, which determined a different succession of colors for the rest of them. But here she constructed each cell as a separate stretch canvas that she affixed to all of the others at the back of the frames with small hand vices, thus replicating in individual cell modules the same geometric grid in the second painting that she had drawn onto the surface of the first. When it came time for her presentation, she quietly and casually explained the system. Basta. No pomp, no bluster, no hot air, not a word about inner turmoil, creative agony, or grappling with the existential metaphysical issues the rest of us deployed in order to protect our frail creations and enhance the impression we wish to convey of ourselves as serious artists. Her manner of presenting her work to us took for granted that we all had read and thought, about, thought as much about art as she had, and had the same sophisticated understanding of it, although that was not true. She completely knocked me out and traumatized the rest of our classmates. But her effect on us didn't feed or flatter or inflate her. She remained, as always, quiet, clipped, self-contained, and shy, with a surprisingly mordant sense of humor. I learned a great deal about contemporary art and art theory from talking to her. She herself was not a conceptual artist and, and didn't much care for conceptual art, but I could not have developed my own work in that direction without having absorbed her cool detachment 
and deep intellectual engagement in the artistic process. That informed stance, that complex psychological attitude toward art would not have occurred to me without her example. So recently, uh, Adrian sent me two images of work that she did at SVA, and she indicated one was before Rosemary, so this is the before, and this is the after Rosemary. But let me digress for a, for a moment and introduce you to another member of our consciousness raising group who could not be present at our early 1980s reunion dinner. Randa Haynes became uh, Randa Haynes could not be there because she had moved to L.A. Born in New York in 1945, she worked first in L.A. as a script supervisor and then as a director and producer. One of her best-known films is Children of a Lesser God, for which Marley Matlin won the 1987 Academy Award as Best Actress. So Randa sent me this picture of herself in the 80s, and she said, Randa and the Prince. Um, but back to Adrian and Rosemary. Through Rosemary, Adrian met Vito Acconci and Rosemary's sister, Bernadette Mayer. Both poets, they had begun a journal, zero to, zero to nine, in April 1967. It was mimeographed and stapled, as were so many publications by emerging poets at the time. Both Rosemary's work and Adrian's work, as you probably know, appeared in zero to nine. The fifth issue included work by artist Robert Smithson, dancer, choreographer, Yvonne Rayner, poets, Kenneth Koch, Clark Coolidge, and others. May 1970, poet Hannah Wiener, who had become close friends with both Adrian and Rosemary, organized an event called the Saturday Afternoon Show at Max's Kansas City. It consisted of small events done by artists all over the restaurant. Adrian, Rosemary, and Vito were all there. Adrian circulated through the crowd with plugged ears, nose, and covered eyes. Rosemary, with camera in hand, followed her. Vito performed his rubbing piece. Rosemary may have been the documentary photographer for that as well. Not long after, Rosemary documented Adrian's catalysis pieces, following her on in the street, riding buses with her. The early 1970s were a remarkable time to be a young female artist in New York. Most of us had read, had already read Betty Friedan's The F Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963. A group called Women Artists in Revolution War had sent letters to the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney demanding that the museums be more inclusive of women and minorities. On August 26, 1970, on the 50th anniversary, of the passing of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, 50,000 women marched down Fifth Avenue. Women were beginning to form consciousness raising groups. In early 1971, I formed one with the artists Martha Diamond and Denise Green and others. For me, the process was thrilling and eye-opening. But by the summer of 1971, I had grown somewhat frustrated with, the, with that group and Rosemary and I decided to talk of forming a new group, which we did and Adrian, Randa, Jane, and Grace came into my life. We met once a week at one another's places, brought wine and snacks, and had animated discussions. Each week we would choose a topic to think about all week long and then discuss when we came together again. Some of our topics were our fathers, femininity, money, sex, appetites. Meanwhile, Rosemary, Adrian, and I were making our art and developing quickly as artists. In 1972, a group of women artists formed the first not-for-profit, artist-directed, and maintained gallery for women artists in the United States, AIR, which actually stands, was for the fire department. If artists lived in buildings, um, there would be an AIR sign, so the, so the fire department, um, this was probably in the 50s, 60s, um, would know to look for people upstairs. Rosemary became a founding member and this is the, an image of the founding members. Um, Rosemary's on the front right. Um, and the group also included Nancy Spiro, Howard Dina Pindell, Agnes Dennis, and Judith Bernstein, among obviously many others. There were 20 in all, I think. Um, they rented a storefront in Soho. 
And then in the late spring of 1973, Rosemary showed sculptures of dyed fabric and bent wood. Gala Placidia was one of them. The Catherines was another. They made quite a stir, as did the work of the artist who showed on the opposite wall, Judith Bernstein. It was quite a combination. Um, I was in the middle of a process that took me from painting to sculpture. So this is a painting from the mid-1960s. Um, and then a large collage work, um, late 60s. And I had also joined a co-op gallery, a different one, and mounted an installation of shape, I thought of them as shape canvases, um, with paper palm trees and jungle sounds. I called it hotels. Later that year, I began to make sculptures. Uh, so I'd now evolved in, from painting to sculpture that I subsequently showed at Holly Solomon Gallery. So now we're back in 2018. And Rosemary's niece, um, Marie Warsh, and I attended the opening of Adrian's exhibition at MoMA and sent this photo from the exhibition to Adrian. Uh, later, um, later, Jane Grace and I went through the exhibition together, it stirred up many memories, and sent Adrian this photo. Randa now lives in Paris. Adrian strongly feels we still have work to do as a, as a consciousness raising group, and so we plan to have a reunion soon in Paris or Berlin. With that in mind, Randa sent us this photo of young women on a Paris rooftop that made her think of us. My serious career in advanced art, that's Carl Andre's term, began when I picked up a copy of Avalanche magazine in my college library. It was around 1973. It was the Vito Acconci issue, and I was astonished by what I saw, documenting Vito's revolutionary body art. Very interesting, the connection that Donna mentioned with Rosemary and Vito and Adrian. So I looked at this and I decided if that's where art was going, that's where I wanted to be. Now also in Avalanche, I found the advertisements in the beginning just fascinating. These tombstone type ads for galleries like Leo Castelli, Sonnabend, no images, just sans serif type, uh, very severe and I noticed the address on a number of the most authoritative of these advertisements, 420 West Broadway. So I decided to explore and I would drive down from college in Connecticut to 420 West Broadway. So does, does 420 West Broadway mean much to anyone here? How many people know, the, know that address? I'm not sure. but. Uh, when I entered the art world in the early 70s, 420 West Broadway was the center of the world. The building had been found by two Dutchmen, Fritz and Wouter, who ran the go-to art handling business, uh, Hague Art Deliveries. So they found this building very inexpensive. They took the ground floor and recruited the top galleries to take the upper floors. Leo Castelli on the second floor, Sonnabend on the third, Virginia Dwan on the fourth, and Andre Emmerich on the fifth. Well, shortly after the building opened, Virginia Dwan's accountants told her that she couldn't lose any more money. They were past the seven-year limit for tax deductions. So she abruptly 
closed the gallery and turned it over to her longtime director, John Weber, who, you know, very lucky move, uh, of an intact gallery that became his. So the day after I graduated from college, June 1974, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. I drove down to New York City, parked in West Broadway near the 420 building, walked upstairs, walked into Leo Castelli, and asked for a job. The two women at the reception counter, the Brunded sisters, who eventually became good friends, were very intimidating, and I could see from their look that there would never be a job for me. So I then walked up to the next floor, Sonabend. The door was locked because in those days, Sonabend would close for the summer from June to early September, and Ileana and her entourage would spend the summer in Venice. That's the way it was in those days. Then I walked up to the fourth floor, John Weber, and it's hard to understand now, but John Weber Gallery did not even have a reception desk. Uh, they, they, basically, no one would ever come in and ask to buy a work of art. It was just a few people you knew, so a reception desk wasn't necessary, and very unlikely that anyone would steal uh, a white-on-white -white painting by Robert Ryman. Today's worth $20, $30 million then. They were hardly saleable. But I saw somebody behind a desk in an office enclosure toward the front, and I walked in. And um, the way in, I saw that there was an empty chair with a typewriter. The woman there was Naomi Spector, the young director. And I asked her for a job. And Naomi said, well, I'm sorry. You know, John Weber, he's away at the Basel Art Fair this week. I really need someone here, but if I hear, hire a young man, John will go crazy. He wants a pretty girl at the desk. So I, I made a proposition. I said, Listen, I see you need help. How about I work for free for a week? And if I do a good job, maybe you can recommend me to John when he comes back. And if it doesn't work out, I'll be very happy. It'll be an amazing experience for me. So she looked again at the empty desk and said, well, I guess I can't say no to that. And I began, and she started immediately gave, gave me dictation, which I didn't know how to do, but uh, I managed. So the next week, John Weber comes in. I'm there at the desk, and he sees me and he slams the door of the inner office, and I hear him this yelling, screaming for several minutes. I said, okay, I'm finished. I'm ready to go. But just as I was about to leave, Naomi sticks her head out the door and says, you're hired. So that's the unlikely way that I ended up at what became the epicenter of the conceptual art discourse. So the place where I sat was hardly even an office. It was a kind of work, a narrow work area with an L-shaped Formica counter. I sat at the small L in front of a window. And Naomi was in the inner office. John Weber would come in every once in a while. So the two of us really ran the gallery. And something, it was a very unique situation and was prompted by Carl Andre's eccentric schedule. So Carl would stay up almost all night watching B movies on television. I heard later they used to do the also with Robert Smithson, and they would phone each other at 3 in the morning with suggestions and what to tune into. So Carl wouldn't wake up until about 2 in the afternoon, and he had a ritual. He was a creature of habit. Every day, he would come to the gallery at 3 o'clock to pick up his mail and his messages. Um, he Almost nobody had his phone number, and... He didn't give out his private address. So the gallery, in fact, my little work area, was where anyone who wanted to connect with Carl, a friend, someone doing a show, they just showed up and sat there at 3 o'clock. And Carl was often 15 minutes late, half hour late. So I ended up entertaining 
the great museum directors of the world, the world's most important artists in this circle, writers. And in addition to the people coming to see Carl, it's just known that that would be a hangout. So Saul LeWitt, Hans Hacke, Robert Mangold, Dan Flavin, the other artists who showed at John Weber, almost every day a number of them would also be there. So th this unlikely location, the only one chair beside mine, the other who arrived had to sit on the Formica counter. Uh, no coffee or drinks offered, nothing to eat, but this became the clubhouse. So one day early on in my tenure, Saul LeWitt brought Adrian Piper and could tell that Saul and the other artists treated her with tremendous respect. And she was closest in age to me, all the artists. I'm born in 1952. So we had an immediate rapport. And I became very interested in the work that she was introducing at that time, the mythic being. So it was quite different from what the hardcore conceptual artists were dealing with. Uh, and could see that she was wary about introducing them to what she was doing. This, this was a very tough bunch. Um, the, there was no acceptance of any soft thinking. Um, I'll give you an example of something I remember Saul LeWitt said. I was very enthusiastic about the work of an artist John Weber had just taken on. And Saul LeWitt said to me, Jeff, it's just surface, no structure there. And it was these pithy comments like that that gave me this amazing education. Uh, also, once I remember a kind of humiliation that the assembled group was there and Robert, Robert Mangold asked me, hey, Jeff, so who's your favorite artist? And I enthusiastically answered, Andy Warhol. And they, they looked at me like I was to totally insane. You know, and uh, I couldn't have said anything more wrong <laughs> for this group. Uh, luckily, recovered and the conversations continued uh, of the, over the next week. So I, I was so interested in Adrian's work and asked her if she might give me a roll of photo prints of the mythic being works that maybe I could show to some all these interesting curators and dealers from around the world who came in to a little work area at John Weber. And she said, she said, sure. And so what I would do is, after the gallery closed, I would tell people who were interested, I want to show you something amazing, what's really going on in art and bring them over to my little rent-controlled apartment, $165 a month behind the gallery on Thompson Street, roll out Adrian's work on the floor. But one after another, these people were just baffled. They, they, they didn't get it. Uh, as, even though these were the most radical artists of their time and they, inv everyone involved in art, pushing art on the edge, a kind of conservatism had set in where it was very hard to move beyond hardcore conceptual and minimalism. It, wouldn't, it was difficult for them to accept this. And so it was very difficult for other young artists too. And it's one of the reasons why, because the slots and galleries were limited, there was this burgeoning of performance art at the kitchen um, and clubs like Max's and CBGB, that's where a lot of the most interesting art was going on. So I was having trouble getting to work at 10 in the morning after staying out late at CBGB's to watch the Talking Heads and other art, other art bands that I liked. So I made a new deal. I would write the gallery newsletter and it would enable me to see what was going on and work on my own show. And I began developing my first exhibition called Lives, an exhibition that involved 
the work of artists who use their own lives as an art medium. And of course, Adrian, Adrian's work fit in very well with this other artists in the show. Hannah Wilkie with a remarkable piece, Scott Burton, of course, Vito Acconci, Jonathan Borofsky. And um, so that was my only real uh, professional engagement with Adrian, something that actually happened. And then, ironically, I, there's a few more images of West Broadway that we'll go through um, before we get to the we, we get to Harvard. Uh, it's a great alternative space, 112 Green Street. Paula Cooper's original gallery. Finelli's, which is still there, you can still visit. And this is Food with Tina Gerard, Carol Gooden, and Gordon Mata Clark before they started the renovation. It's on the corner of Prince and Worcester and what they eventually did. And this is one of the early shows at John Weber, Daniel Buren. That's what the inside of the gallery looked like. The famous Vito Acconci seedbed at Sonnabend. Leo Castelli was much more polished. Jasper Johns and Roy Lichtenstein. These galleries defined the way to show art in the 70s, but it's, they, they seem very antiquated compared to what galleries look like now. And that's the kitchen. Avalanche, Art Right, the like zero through nine, uh, one of the central artist created magazines. That's Saul in his Hester Street studio, and Adrian lived in the same building on another floor. And I just threw these in for comic. This is me with Scott Burton and Gregory Batcock looking at it. But it's a performance by Stephen Varble. And uh, I used to have some style. Uh, that, that's me with Scott and Philip Perlstein. It's around the time of the live show. So now we get to Harvard. And what, what I find fascinating is Adrian and I used to go meet every, every other Saturday or so to go disco dancing in a dingy club off of Harvard Square. And when I saw the amazing, mesmerizing work of her dancing in the public square projected in the MoMA show. It brought me back to this. And I, I didn't realize that I was maybe the first person getting funk lessons uh, back in 1976. I also remembered it was, uh, it was frustrating because I couldn't really engage in dancing with Adrienne because she entered into her own world and so it was, she was already there, this piece from years later, in the public square of Berlin, she was already there of mixing the embodiment of art in her persona, philosophy, yoga. Uh, I did not realize what I was experiencing then. So, even though a long time passed before reconnecting over email with Adrian, someone who stayed with me and her presence continued to resonate and affected the whole course of my career and my understanding of art. So very honored to be part of this symposium. I guess we can ask each other questions. That's so we're going to talk among ourselves or ask each other questions and open it up. Um, I don't think we have to press anything. I think it just is on. Um, <laughs> okay, since I started, I, Don, I'm curious if during these um, 
sort of um, consciousness raising sessions at your th themes, et cetera. Did you guys talk about your work? Well, not everybody was an artist, so right. it depended who was there that night. Right. But I know that, um, and different, that we were the core group, but I remember Kathy Dillon came one night who was in, you know, people who were in photos of uh, Vito's seed bed. Um, but when it was when it was all women artists, we talked about our art. One topic I was because I was reviewing all this was a long time ago. But one topic was how do we, what's our process for making art? And we describe that and then talk about it. But the the first consciousness raising group, the one that was so dramatic for me, uh, was where we would go around. We talk about a topic. We'd go around in the circle, and everybody spoke without being interrupted for a certain amount of time, like maybe five minutes that we decided on. And what was so great for me was that, I mean, usually in when you're having a conversation, a group conversation, if one person says something, then other people figure, well, that was said, so I don't need to say that. But when you heard the same thing from people around the circle, it was quite powerful. And... You know, I thought of it as being, you live in a building and everybody has rats running around or something, and you think you're the only one. But if you all talk about it together and understand that you're all, you've all got the same situation and you can confront the landlord together. So, so it was like that. The, the group with Adrian was much more conversation. And, and that was okay with me because I'd always had, I'd had that other experience already. So, Don, I wanted to ask you about the challenges of being an artist during this time. Because I mentioned I was very aware of how tough the sort of the established prestigious artists were and how difficult it was to move beyond minimalism and what had been accepted as the successful art forms. And some people just continued with minimalism and there's sort of second and third generation, uh, but you wanted to, to break through and do something completely fresh and want to ask you about the challenges of that time. Well, I think, I mean, my in the late 60s, it was very hard to be an artist, in, a woman artist in New York. Nobody wanted to come to my studio, this poets around St. Mark's. and um, Ted Berrigan came and that was great, but, um, uh, then when the women's movement came along and women started to notice I mean, how many women artists had been in the Whitney Biennial, for instance, and women started to share stories like went to this gallery or that gallery with their slides and the, and the person at the desk would say, oh, we already have a woman artist. Wow. So then we understood it wasn't us, it was the system. And, uh, but for me, um, well, I'm trying to think through the little process here. Um, minimalism was, and I, I like some minimalism. Um, and I think that piece with the brick wallpaper that I showed was kind of my stab at it. But it's, there was all, also around that time people were saying, I was still doing paintings and Les Levine said to me, but you can't paint anymore. And there seemed to be so much, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do that. And, you can't. and I thought art should be about possibilities. And the women's movement, I thought, oh, well, maybe women make different art and I'll be looking for that. And so I can just feed stuff back in and just do what, it was very liberating to me. I was no longer just Donna Dennis wants to be an artist and is in New York, but it was, now I had a cause and something I was interested in discovering and being part of. And Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own was, was huge for me. Um, but uh, yeah, and there became a community of women artists who were sharing information and supportive of one another. And so it was, it was a great time once, once that opened up. And AI Art Gallery started and then I don't know, pretty quickly I was with Holly Solomon, which was great. <laughs> so. Holly was, made a tremendous contribution to the culture of art in New York City and internationally. Who did? Holly. Holly, Holly. yes. Holly was, I, 
very quickly. I mean, when you're young, things can happen so quickly as an artist. And I was with this wonderful gallery, a, a real character, Holly Solomon. Did you know her well? Very well. Uh, and we yeah, let's together. talk about Holly a little yeah. bit, maybe, yeah. <laughs> if we want yeah. to. So, so this, this it's, it's Holly, um, well, the same way that, say, Virginia Dwan was sort of left behind by our history until recently, now you know, very, very well studied and celebrated. I think something similar has happened with Holly, that this was the most significant innovation in the gallery system the, of the entire 1970s was Holly's emergence. Mm -hmm. And uh, really liberated <laughs> a lot of the, the, the art discourse. Uh, and the gallery closed some years ago. Uh, unfortunately, Holly's own collection of masterpieces had to be dispersed. But I remember how exciting that was. It really opened up the dialogue. Yeah, and there, there was a, I mean, we're getting away from talking about Adrian, but <laughs> um, that was another response to minimalism was this pattern and decoration. And I know there's shows going on right now in Europe that are celebrating that, that just opposite side of moving away from minimalism. Let's talk about Adrian's art exhibition trajectory in the 70s. And Bruce, I think you have a lot of insight. So I was quite surprised when you showed the images of the self-portraits with Kant, that that didn't appear publicly till 1987. And so it was, she was always so influential for me. But in the 70s, how much of this art actually was presented in central location so people could know about it? Well, you know, as, as, as far as I know, um, in this early kind of conceptual practice, they were in kind of the major shows that were, you know, information. Um, she had pulled, there was another show at the New York Cultural Center that she pulled out of um, in reaction to, I think, the bombing of Cambodia um, and, you know, so the highly political time. Um, so individual works were shown. I don't really know when she first, you know, like it's in the um, chronology in the catalog, I'm sure, about when she was first shown. I mean, she was doing these, I mean, as I alluded to before, she really never talked about, you know, her work that she was doing in art to sort of her fellow people when we were in graduate school um, in philosophy. She kept those separately, even though they were clearly unified in her own thinking. Um, it was a different thing. And I don't know, I mean, she would have chose really in the, coming kind of in the 80s, it, um, John Weber, right? And... There was starting to, I mean, I guess later this afternoon we'll be talking about um, her kind of um, trajectory within Europe where I think things were shown more commonly. Um, the, I remember there was that show that was at the um, New Museum around 2001. That was a retrospective, really. So, but I don't, I don't really know much about um, kind of. I think it also shows that during that time, it was a much more intimate dialogue. So uh, all the major artists knew about Adrienne Piper. Yes. And she was considered, admired as one of, one of the most significant people. So it was interesting that could happen without a, what today would be a conventional commercial career at that time. Right, and I think your point is exactly right, that it was a much smaller art world that worked by, you know, artists knowing one, one another, hanging out together, visiting studios, et cetera, and not always in the public light. But something you mentioned really surprises me. So here was arguably the greatest artist of her generation at school with you at Harvard, and she didn't share with the fellow students that about her, all of her achievements and her recognition. That's fascinating. Right, I mean, I think it was, and Donna, maybe you talked to Adrian about this at some point, that she was, and I, I could be wrong, I just got the feeling that she did not, she wanted to be taken more seriously as a philosopher, or taken seriously as a philosopher, and once you start saying, you have this whole other thing you're doing, that immediately takes you away. I mean, it's the same within the art world. I used to work on the artist Isamu Noguchi, and Noguchi would 
sort of always be taking criticism for his doing things other than straight sculpture by New York school artists because you're working in industrial design, you're working in um, designing stage sets, etc. That seemed to be a kind of pulling you away from true seriousness, true rigor in one field. And I think that's you know the kind of model that she was sort of reacting to. She was also in the in the group. She didn't talk much about, even though she and Rosemary were, you know, doing things that we've shown images of. Um, she didn't. Uh, Rosemary and I hadn't really shown anywhere yet. Adrian already been in information show at Museum of Modern Art, um, but she was modest about it. She didn't. She didn't bring it up a lot. But I was struck, Jeffrey, with your image of Adrian was quite a petite woman with all these guys. And I asked her about um, something along that line, and she said that she she was comfortable. Uh, she didn't she didn't really think that it was going to be hard for her to show her work or or be part of that scene. But she thought part of it was that she'd grown up as a as an only child. Uh, and she was comfortable with older people, and because um. there was qu quite an age gap between right. her and Saul Lewitt, and but it was totally natural. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, she came in as a peer. Mm -hmm. uh, something I, I wanted to discuss, and so one of the things that astonished me in the exhibition was the excellence of the mid-60s works, the late-60s works, the sort of psychedelic works, how great they are. And then the minimalist works. It is as great as any other minimal art I've ever seen. So Adrienne, if she had wanted to, she could have followed that path and making work sort of in the vein, coming from LeWitt, Donald Judd. Those works were just great. And, but then that's not where she wanted to go. She wanted to push it beyond. And maybe, Donna, you can address that because you may have discussed those issues with her. No, I haven't actually. Uh, I think at least when you read her writing about you know, her own development, she talks about the effect of sort of the political you know, developments of 1970, 68, 69, 70. Um, and that that kind of pushed her or pulled her into a more engaged, kind of socially oriented kind of art making um, and kind of um, thematizing. Um, even though, you know, it's interesting her whole kind of philosophy art thing because she was really initially, I mean, I think it should be clear. I mean, if you read her, or it is, maybe the way we were talking, you know, she initially was an art student and discovered philosophy as a way of kind of, of pursuing issues that had emerged in her own art practice. So it was not that she sort of was also a philosophy major and also doing art. I mean, she became kind of interested in philosophy as a way of kind of digging deeper into the issues of perception, identity, et cetera, that was um, kind of Kind of, um, kind of the 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 ground of her art making at that point. So it's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's. She was clearly pulled along, by her developing interests and her, that were not so much moving, horizontally as moving sort of. More deeply, I think, into the issues she was finding interesting and and important to her, and driving her. I mean, clearly, there's an incredible drive there. Jeffrey, I'm curious if when you guys were um, sort of going out at Harvard, you know, going dancing, seeing each other every few weeks, did she talk about her work? I mean, she knew you from an art context originally. So was she talking about work that she was doing then, talking about philosophy? What did you guys talk about, or you just went out <laughs> dancing? See, see <laughs> we're, we were both in such rigorous programs. Right. So Harvard Business School is like boot camp. Right. And you know from your program, tremendous demands. So it was more like letting off steam. Right. That's, that's, so no, we, we, we didn't uh, spend hours talking about aesthetic issues. 
But did you know about the um, kind of the artistic project she was working on? And, yes. Yeah. Because they weren't really shown, at least certainly not up there. So there was this kind of knowledge. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, should we open up to? Yeah. Oh. Right, and there were other things. In fact, I was reading in looking at the dating of the works in the exhibition, realizing she was doing those while she was a graduate student here, there, which is really kind of amazing to me. Right, the, the, her first year at Harvard is when the mythic being works that I showed to people were done, and some of them are, take place in Boston and Cambridge. Yes, so I, without sharing it with you and other colleagues, she was making extraordinary radical work. Interesting. Okay, so maybe we could take some questions from the audience. I remember in the 70s seeing images of her early performances on the bus, Maxis, Kansas City, and a couple of others. Were they actually uh, published during those years? Or, I mean, they weren't at exhibitions as far as I know, but she did them then. And I have an awareness of them from that time. So I'm just wondering how they came to the public. I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, I said the inside art world did know about them. And I'm not sure whether I saw them from photographs that she showed me or but I, I assume they must have been published in some of the underground magazines we spoke about. No, and Adrian also has, you know, is great archivist of her own material. So she certainly had those things and got them from Rosemary, I guess, because she was a photographer. Yes. Yes, uh, um, and it was interesting. Rosemary Mayer was the the photographer for Max's Kansas City and Catalysis pieces, as I said. And I asked Adrian, we've been emailing, um, if she was, because I think I read one thing where some a writer said that, um, or saw Rosemary as part of the piece, this person following. And I asked Adrian if she'd felt that. Uh, that Rosemary was part of the piece, and she said no, she did not yet have that sort of sense of the, you know, what it all looked like together. So, so Rosemary was just documenting it for her friend, and they did favors back and forth as friends. But, but also, it, it shows something interesting, you know, that belief that I have in art. If if someone does something truly extraordinary, even if it's not fully registered at the time, because of Bruce, people like you and others, it, it almost always comes out. It, is, it, is, it finds its life. And even if something did not fully get the attention it deserved in 1973, it's something we all study now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I showed the picture of Adrian at the um, January show, you know, bas basically being hired as a secretary which sometimes might be taken as kind of some sort of performance, but it wasn't. She was actually just hired by Sissy Glaub to work there in this gallery that was basically a pop-up space for his gallery because he didn't have a, a bricks and mortar space at that time. But I've been thinking about how these things are kind of rethought about. And um, in the context of kind of the kind of thinking about it thinking about her performance career, I think it's important to sort of realize the original context in which these occurred, which was, in this case, not a performance context, though clearly in any job one is performing. Are there any other questions? I just want to mention, because Hannah Wilkie's sister is here, and she oh. just uh, asked this question. And we just casually talked about something, a very important thing that I did with Hannah in the live show that Adrian was also part of. And it was a, a work that was shown in Connie Butler's WAC exhibition. 
uh, but you could see the mechanism, but you couldn't really hear it. So what Hannah did is this, this was the beginning of answering machine tapes. This was a giant thing at the time of mm. 1975. And Hannah recorded all of the messages from these well-known art world guys trying to chat her up. And this was something that you know, no one, you, know, you would never be aware of. These, these are you know, kind of the, all the, the famous art stud guys. And, it, you, and Hannah just, it was, was it straightforward? She just played back the messages and you couldn't, you, unbelievable. And of course, this, this, this shocked people. This, this was, you know, people with, Les Levine uh, made a big, big uh, issue and he stormed out of the show. Uh, he said, I'm the one who invented answering machine art. But that wasn't really, I think it was just his being so indignant and shocked by this. So it, it and some other family oh, members through, and girlfriends, and, you know, feminist women. You're right. You're right. So it, yeah. it, it was. It was every. It, it was just a sample of, yeah, of her, of her life, and uh, still think it's it's an amazing piece, uh, but it's. I just mention it because this is part of the context of Adrian's emergence as an artist in early mid '70s in New York City. Yeah, I had a question. First, I want to thank you for your presentation, which I enjoyed very much. And I had a question related to mythic being. And Jeffrey noted how important that piece, uh, or that series of work was for him. And it's clearly something that we also felt working on the exhibition, that it was a defining moment in Adrian Piper's work. And the show made that quite clear. You know, after the spir Food for the Spirit, suddenly there's this kind of not jump into the void, but jump into the world, this moment where she goes really into performance. And I was curious to maybe know a bit more about how people responded to Mythic Being at the time, if maybe you witnessed some of the performances. You talk about the fact that people would not really understand the work in, in, in the 70s. And could you just elaborate a little bit on, on, on the reception of that series of work? Okay, so I, I, what, what I did is like well-known museum directors, curators were coming in, as I said, to the work area at John Weber Gallery. And I was so enthusiastic about what Adrian was doing. I said, I have to show you what's really going on now. And I would take them over. And so these were people who were just very fixed in the minimal conceptual dialogue. And these people just didn't get it at all. At first, um, it was verboten to do figurative drawing. Okay, uh, and second, they just didn't get this thing of what for us is so just essential of this gender shifting and people redefining who they are. Uh, then you know it that basically didn't exist, and um, that gender roles were much more conservatively defined. Um, so. It, it made it very different, difficult for people in that sphere to take the leap. But for younger artists, and this was just, it was absolutely where things were going. So I think there was a generational shift. Hi. I was interested in this contrast between the two worlds that she occupied, the art world on one side and the philosophy world at Harvard on the other side, and how um, socially different they must have been. So I was just wondering, as people who have experienced both, um, how, how does, did one inhabit such different worlds? Because I imagine that uh, at Harvard, you know, if there wasn't any gender shifting in the art world in New York, I mean, it was certainly a little bit more <laughs> open-minded, whereas I guess at Harvard, there would be this very, um, I guess, I imagine, kind of um, conservative or masculine sort of culture of conducting philosophy. So I just was hoping you could elaborate a bit on what that world felt like. Well, I think in terms of what the world was like among graduate students, 
first of all, there were um, you know a significant number of um, women graduate students. You know, within philosophy, the faculty was not integrated in that way. Though, um, I think the last year we were there, Martha Nussbaum came and was jointly appointed in classics and in um, and in philosophy. But other than that, sort of the entire faculty was male. But the graduate students were completely, you know, a mixed group. I mean, you'll see sort of in um, some reflective surfaces, the dancing scenes. I mean, there's, um, you know, graduate students of, of every kind there. Um, so I don't really find it. I mean, the, the world of philosophy was certainly, you know, the, the powerful figures were, were male. But the kind of among graduate students, it was really kind of a, I think, um, you know, relatively kind of equal situation. We were also in the same boat, really. Both men and women were getting jobs, so it, it didn't seem that that gendered in that way to me. Now, other people here who were, you know, in graduate school with us, um, you know, might have a different view of women. Um, in terms of the art world, I don't know because at that point I really wasn't involved in the art world. I mean, this was something I came to later. Well, the art world then had a, a celebrity system, right. so. It wasn't like now with Damien Hirst, but Saul Witt, Carl Andre, these were giants. And if you were sort of on the margins and you saw Saul Witt walking down the street, you said, wow, that's Saul Witt. And Adrian Piper shared in that kind of celebrity. She was known as a very important figure. So it's interesting coming to Harvard, she just dropped all of that. And and didn't share who she really was with her fellow students. No, I'm completely amazed, actually, the more I learned about this, because she was you know, a fellow graduate student. And people eventually knew that she had some kind of art career, but it was not you know, known. You know, the um, sort of notoriety or the um, kind of depth of her work at all. I mean, she had given me this, this pamphlet that she had written, but that was really the only time we talked about her work. It's really she was talking about philosophy there. She started taking philosophy classes at Stanford. Please wait for the microphone. I was gonna say she started taking philosophy classes like at City University of New York in the 1960s and also published in 72 an interview with Lucy Lepard about the catalysis works. And so I think that's like maybe the first time that they were publicly spoken about, although they weren't necessarily published in any way or reproduced as the images themselves, but the whole interview about what she was doing appeared. And I don't remember what the journal was, but it's, it came out with that in around that time. So there was writing about it, even if like the works weren't necessarily out there. Wait for the mic. And then, oh, just I mean, in terms of her circulating, so John Perot interviews her, no, um, or reviews the work, um, at least twice in the early '70s, and then she was publishing the the ads for some of the works, and she right. was in Zero to Nine, and then Zero to Nine organized a few um, performance events, uh, street works, and she was she was yeah she was circulating quite a bit. Right, the Village Voice ads. That's those are very important. That's that's um, and like way 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 ahead of her time. Of uh, it's like you compare it to the artists today who understand how to use Instagram. You know, it, it it really amazing amazing interventions. And yes, that that so she got the work out in in ways that didn't depend on a conventional gallery structure. And in those days, everyone read The Village Voice. And she was mailing her artwork to major curators as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to Let's hear from Donna on this, because I think, you know, the first speaker, um, when he said the beliefs and commitments, and the way that in the feminist movement, and in your small group, people are speaking as a, at least striving to share their truths and working and making a kind of an informal commitment. I mean, one of the things was to create something that was uh, 
informal or not, but in somewhat of an alternative to the hierarchical um, art world that had the star celebrity. And just your experience of, as a friend, as this, when she made this transition, just what that was, and she goes to Harvard. And I mean, um, I just would love to hear you speak of it from your own perception. Of, of Adri Adrian okay. going to Harvard? Right, and the, the, the formality of shifting into the philosophy world, the, the graduate world. I mean, I just would. Well, to be honest, um, we, we got together once a week with our group, and Adrian and I didn't socialize much. I remember going to a wonderful dance party at her loft. Um, but uh, we got out of, the group kind of fell apart. Sometimes that happened over a summer. People went away, and then it just didn't come back together again. But um, I'd lost touch with her by the time she went to Harvard. We, in recent years, we've developed a much closer email friendship. Um, but I, that transition wasn't something I was really very much aware of. So, yeah, hi. Um, I, I have a sort of a follow up question, I guess, on for Donna about um, this time that we're talking about because you're having these meetings, um, the women are getting together, the consciousness, we're talking about uh, Adrian going in and sort of going into, I think, sort of these established kind of, uh, I don't know if we can call them boys clubs, but they're sort of like these giants, these intellects. And um, she's she's on par, she's pacing with them. And then, uh, you know, in the 70s, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment was uh, something they are working on in 76, I was only six, but I helped out a little bit, okay. um, licking stamps. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that there's a transitional moment there, uh, culturally and also uh, in her work somewhat. I, I thought maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Thanks. I'm not quite understanding the question. Um, and I can't see you well, talking. I think I'm just talking about sort of uh, Feminism coming to the forefront uh, culturally and how that impacted her work at that time. Um, well, as I said, we, we really didn't, we talked about, um, I remember we had, a, we had a long discussion one night. There was, some men's, there was a men's group because men's groups were forming too and we wanted to, the group wanted to, the men's group wanted to meet with us and we, we, we talked a lot about whether that would be a good idea or not, and I don't think we we did meet with them, and the, I'm sure I know we didn't meet with them in the end. But um, but Adrian, I mean, we didn't really. She didn't talk about her work in the group much. It was really more about, and she has told me since that it um, that the group, if I get this right, if I in an email that. Um, that she was able in the group to kind of work out some personal things that that I may probably saying this wrong, but might have been distracting otherwise. So um, for her, I think it was quite social, um, supportive that way. You know, an interesting group of women. Um, for me, it was that way too. That the first group I was in felt much more political, and then the. The second group was kind of just a wonderful weekly discussion on topics of common interest for all of us. I don't know if that answers your question very well, but. Um, it strikes me, and especially after having had the pleasure of seeing both exhibitions, the one in New York and the one here at the Hammer, and you know, I'm also married to Bruce, which I've talked about Adrian with him a fair amount, that there's some kind of ability to process a kind of complexity that she has privileged in her practice that comes from, of course, all the aspects of her development as a human being, but that it leaves her with a, an ability to 
maintain doubt and wariness, <laughs> which many artists lose or exaggerate to a degree that's also crippling, but that she stays balanced in there somehow using the philosophy to not overvalue certain aspects of the fame of walking down West Broadway and being recognized, which probably at moments in her life she thought was perhaps, I mean, it's good. She was happy that her work was taken seriously, but I'm not sure she invested in it the same way some people did in the sense that she had this other life. I think both, it's almost a dialectical thing there for her to have the, the education and the philosophy side of things, the teaching, the writing, the reading of these deeply complex people that have a longer history and then this sort of entry into this, you know, paradigm shattering way of working in an art world that even if you were well known, among how many people, you know, I think she used the two sides to keep a, a solid footing somehow and see the world in a way that's clearly from these exhibits far more complex than many other artists' manner of observing things. Is that I, the two shows seem to embody also different sides of her personality? They're quite different. Well, I, maybe just to, I mean, that's an interesting thought because, I mean, Holly, because, um, you know, I, I guess my response to that is if you've sort of worked seriously on the critique of pure reason and you've engaged with the incredible well, complexity and especially depth of thinking and um, sort of range of things that are connected in Kant's, well, all three critiques, then it sort of, it gives a different sort of perspective on what intellectual work is, what kind of exploration is, and not that it makes the other seem less important, but it provides some kind of sort of understanding that you know, there, there's something really like amazing out there that you're approaching in different ways, but that somehow you haven't yet achieved. And that is not such a big deal compared to like the critique of your reason. The word rigor was also, you know, commonly wielded as a weapon against artists who wanted to move the dialogue in a different place that was less familiar, and I, I imagine that didn't disturb her very much. <laughs> I just, I don't know if so much it's, it's a question, but um, maybe a comment that she never actually uses the word feminism she's always referring to the consciousness raising groups. But I don't, I don't recall her using the word feminism until a October questionnaire, like in the 90s or something. Um, so, so just, it's, but the consciousness raising groups appear in multiple places as something that has influenced her greatly. And she, you know, as I said at the end, she feels like we still have work to do, our particular group. Um, so, uh, I mean, it sounds kind of, kind of, work do you kind think of daunting, is? but, um, you know, as, as elder women, we have, the young, younger women really need to hear from us and a sense that, I mean, our, she wrote a paper that she delivered in Oslo and we went back and forth by an email commenting on it, um, but that, I mean, one of the key things is that young women, that that men go through a kind of um, you know process where they come into the community of men and it's difficult. They have to turn away from their mothers and they 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 lose a lot and they get sort of sealed off. They can get sealed off emotionally, um, but she thinks that women also need or girls growing up need to go through some sort of initiation rites that are demanding and. Uh, and you know, before they come in, before they're accepted into the community of women, that you know, it's it's a very interesting uh, you know idea. But I think that's one of the things she wants to to discuss, and how to how to do that, how to. So. It's it's very much in her thoughts now.
terms of feminism, I, I just remember that there were some women who were interested in women's art, or and there were others who called themselves feminist artists, and it, it was kind of in flux. You, you weren't necessarily a feminist. Sometimes you were just a woman artist, and there was some kind of dialogue between that. But what I remember most is the word empowerment. And it seems to me that taking on something like Kant or studying philosophy is an incredible way to empower yourself, You know, taking on the intellectual life as well as the, your emotional life and your social life was an incredible way just to be empowered at the time, and any time, I suppose. <clears throat> so a, a couple of questions, really. Um, one concerns the issue of race, which hasn't come up, and I'm wondering to what extent that was also part of the discussion uh, in the early 1970s in the consciousness raising group that was mentioned. The other concerns the issue of philosophy. It's very interesting that she was interested in, interested in Kant, but there's Kant and then there's Kant, right? I mean, she's interested in the second critique, so Bruce, why do you think she didn't go to the third critique, which is the one that's about aesthetics, and went to the second critique instead? Well, um, I think the primary sort of focus of her work for, for most of her time, initially though, it, it you know, the, the, the um, let's see, what shall I say, the, um, and, and again, I, you know, have not read Adrian's entire book on this, um, but though though the the thrust of her work was around kind of the morality and the kind of an opposition between kind of a human 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 view and a Kantian view, those were views of the self, and it was in the critique of pure reason that she was looking in at this. She looking seriously at a way of defining identity of the individual through time and through kind of personal change that was based on the concepts kind of employed both about yourself and about the world. So I think she sort of, though she dealt with the later critiques, the heart of her work was on the first critique. And that's where she kind of went first and that's where I think she stayed very much. And in terms of the consciousness raising group, we didn't really talk, we, we really focused on women's lives and our lives as women and as young artists, we really didn't talk about race. Interesting. Well, I see we're out of time. Yes. So <laughs> we, have a, we have a clock here. <laughs> so I guess we will break for whatever, however long the lunch break is. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we'll be back at 2.15 with the next panel, Voices in Dialogue, Time Travelers. Thanks. <laughs>